Uh, my name is Charlie Nesson. I'm a professor of law at Harvard Law School, where I teach the law of evidence as my primary field. I uh, am the founder of the Berkman Center, and uh, am very pleased on behalf of the Berkman Center, both to be here and to thank Beth Novak and Dan Hunter for putting on this marvelous conference. Berkman has been a sponsor of State of Play now for some years, and uh, it's really with great pride to see how this conference has developed and the direction uh, in which it's going. Uh, thank you also to Singapore for being such a marvelous host. Uh, Dan was good enough to make a little bit of time for me to just say a few words to you, and I hope I'll impinge on your lunchroom conversation for not too long. But um, I was eager to describe to you uh, my experience during the last year and to give you some indication of the direction that at least uh, we see this effort going. Uh, last year I taught a class at Harvard Law School called Cyber One, Law in the Court of Public Opinion. This was a class that in a sense was like an evidence class which deals with the proof of truth in courts, except that the idea was in this modern day, we're going beyond the courtroom. And lawyers have confronted the problem of persuading to much larger audiences and persuading uh, within uh, the, the environment of new media. The essence of the class focuses on a style of argument, which I call empathic. It's empathic as opposed to oppositional, the typical lawyer oppositional argument is head-to-head, -head, cutting, cross-examination, all that sort of thing. Empathic argument starts with a different idea. The essence of it is that if you want to persuade someone, you first have to convince that person that you understand the problem as they see it and they understand it. And only after they grasp the thought that you understand their problem will they actually start to listen to you. That's a big step for law students. That's not the natural style. And at the same time, once you've got that idea, the next thought is to project your argument out into this current environment using new media as a way to do it. The way this class was structured <clears throat> uh, has some experimental qualities to it. The course consisted of a face-to-face -face class that was completely typical, 50 students in a small amphitheater room. But there was also, in addition to the face-to-face -face class with Harvard Law students, an extension school class that was done uh, entirely in Second Life. That is a distance education class in which students formally enrolled with a, a course leader who was my daughter. Rebecca, who uh, at that time and still is a doctoral student in com computational linguistics and a graduate of the law school uh, and uh, a marvelous teacher in her own right. In addition to that second extension of the class through the extension school, the class was also open to a degree to any members of Second Life. So the at-large audience of Second Life was a third component of the class. This was a first foray for us into using a virtual environment in teaching. And uh, it was uh, not only exciting, but extremely educational uh, for us. I'd say the lessons that we learned were simple but powerful. Uh, first. Uh, you use the technology for what it's good for, and you don't use it for what it's not good for. It's like basic. Uh, it runs against the idea that somehow technology is going to solve all the problems or be a panacea or some magic bullet, and we can suddenly do distance education with it. 
it's a much more practical approach. The idea is to seek to take advantage of what the technology offers and to stay away from what it can't do. It puts a challenge to teachers to explore the new aspects of the technology and bring it to bear on the actual teaching of one's class. <clears throat> no question that the attractiveness of this environment from an educator's point of view is the potential it offers for distance education. Within the university world, I would say distance education has been an unfulfilled dream so far, uh, with significant worries as to whether somehow education at a distance will dilute the experience, the local experience of education on the campus, worries about that, and uh, real concerns about whether it's possible to have an experience, a distance education experience, that won't actually detract from the face-to-face -face experience uh, of the classroom. On the basis of just this first foray, and these were initial steps for us as teachers, it's clear that there's a huge array of possibilities that are yet unexplored. And yet, I'm convinced on the basis of this experience that the benefits of the virtual environment for universities doing distance education are huge, real, substantial benefits and that the future that this medium offers to universities is immensely powerful. We first confronted the differences between the brick and mortar environment and the virtual environment and found right away that there are many things in the brick and mortar real world environment that are cornerstones of workable education that we just were not necessarily fully appreciative of as we went into the virtual. The virtual environment typically has been used for education by having students relate to a website. And the websites are very good at, can be very good, at presenting course material in organized and quite complete fashion. But they are clearly lacking in the sense of a, of a persistent campus environment in which students gather and have all of those informal interactions which actually lead to the making of community. There were many of my colleagues, I shouldn't say many, there were some of my colleagues who expressed a kind of skepticism about this effort, thinking that uh, the virtual environment offered by Second Life was just a kind of fancy, unnecessary extension. But it immediately became apparent that the ability of students to uh, have an avatar, to uh, assemble on a campus, here, allow me to, Our Second Life campus, if it will come up on our screen here, it may not, although I can't tell you why. There we go, a little bit weak. Uh, it was a replica of the Harvard Law School. We took an island, Berkman Island, on which we built a replica of Harvard Law School. This is Austin Hall, which is the oldest of the Harvard Law School buildings. And if we were on the net, I could kind of drive you around and show you the Charles River and a, a model courtroom and an open seminar environment. Uh, this environment immediately conveyed a message to the students coming in that this was a serious enterprise. Uh, the idea of a campus carries with it a sense of the behaviors that are expected uh, and the seriousness uh, of the undertaking. Uh, Students came in initially with just their basic avatars, uh, learning Second Life as they went. But as they went, almost every student 
somehow added to their avatar some sense of style, uh, some sense of fashion. And it became apparent that just the very question of what are you wearing and how did you do that was um, a stimulating focus for students simply to relate in informal ways. And the whole process of starting to engage, uh, well, <laughs> all right, we're gone. I used to work for a man named Fred Friendly. He was the head of CBS News, and he did a series of programs called Fred Friendly Seminars, which were kind of you know, interesting on television in the United States in the 1980s. And Fred had a famous saying, can I do this in Singapore? It was, technology is out to fuck you. <laughs> well, these attributes of message in the environment and of look, of avatar, while they're interesting and engaging for students, they're not enough to draw students into the environment. And so we found that uh, in order to create the substantive focus for students to really be attracted and spend time, we needed to do some very simple things. Uh, so for example, it was very important that we held regular class meetings in Second Life regular office hours in Second Life so that students had reason to come there. We made uh, lecture videos available in Second Life. The way this class actually worked is we would have our face-to-face -face meetings on a Monday. Those meetings would be videotaped, the lectures basically videotaped, made available in the Second Life environment for the extension school students on the Wednesdays. And on Wednesdays, students would gather, absorb the lectures, and in that Second Life environment, have a moderated discussion which was specifically hosted for them by my daughter, Rebecca. And so it becomes important when you're thinking of multiple audiences that each audience, in a sense, sees itself as primary with someone hosting that audience in particular so that nobody is in the position of feeling like somehow they come second uh, in terms of importance. We also uh, created a sandbox uh, on Berkman Island that was very attractive for students to come and just uh, engage the activity of building things. And that often produced uh, a great deal of interaction uh, amongst students. And we opened the activities of Berkman Island as much as we could to the at-large audience. And over the course of the semester, developed a considerable audience of at-large uh, residents of Second Life who took an interest and proved to be enormously helpful to our students in teaching them how to work and move in Second Life, build things and do things. And as this process went forward, there was just no question that a community developed that was not only attentive to what was going on, but proud of what was developing. And by the end of the course, there was a real feeling of camaraderie amongst the various people working. As teachers, we had a natural instinct to rely on the kinds of assumptions about how things go that are normal to a classroom, and quickly found that no, that's, that doesn't necessarily carry over. So that, for example, uh, the normal expectation that students speak one at a time doesn't work in Second Life. Uh, the normal expectations of uh, waiting for another to stop doesn't work in Second Life. What was most interesting to us is that once we engaged the structure of multi-threaded discussion, multi, I shouldn't say threaded, just multi-discussion, threads of discussion overlapping each other. It turned out that it worked better in some very significant respects. So for example, the biggest problem that teachers have, I believe, 
has to do with the level of participation of students. On the one hand, there are some students who never say a word. They just, you can't draw them out. And on the other hand, there are students that are gunners. You can't shut them up unless you get almost insulting. <laughs> well, lo and behold, it turns out that in this multi-threaded text environment, on the one hand, the quiet students felt comfortable participating. They could take their time. They could formulate their thought. They could look at it on screen before they hit the button. And we had more participation from quiet students than we had ever had before. On the other hand, the gunners who would write paragraphs, you quickly realized, and I think they quickly realized, that people stopped reading them. You could just skip them. <laughs> now, this had another extremely interesting quality for me. I teach evidence, the law of evidence. That's like objection, sustained, objection, overruled, all that sort of thing. I've always wanted to do mock trials in teaching evidence because you'd just like to have the students directly engaged, but it would never work. It wouldn't work because students don't ask good questions. They tend to run on. Witnesses run on. You don't have a transcript, and so when someone makes an objection, you can't quite pinpoint the objection. You don't know quite what you're talking about. Lo and behold, in this text environment, those problems are solved. The natural structure of the environment leads students to be concise with their questions. And it leads the witnesses to be concise with their answers. And it generates a transcript just as you go along. And so it gets to be an extremely useful tool for when an objection is made, being able to focus on just what the problem is and deal with it. So as a teaching instrument, this was a new capacity of this environment as far as I was concerned, and an extraordinarily uh, useful one. Would someone do me a favor and pass me up a glass of water? So thank you. For example, we did a mock trial of uh, Bragg versus Linden Labs. Now, I know some of you are familiar with Bragg, but just quickly, the facts of the case, so to speak. Uh, Bragg is a guy who had bought real estate in Second Life. He had amassed something close to $3,000 in US money value of real estate in Second Life, um, completely legit. But at that point, he figured out how he could take advantage of the auction structure of Second Life. Apparently, Second Life had been preparing its auctions by identifying parcels of property that would be auctioned, giving them a number, setting up a web page, but not linking that page to their main page until they were ready to initiate the auction. Bragg figured out how to find the page before it had been linked. And so for a number of parcels, he found the page, initiated the auction, and bought very cheap since nobody else knew that the auction was going on. And there he was with some additional properties. When Linden Labs first got onto this, they immediately rescinded his illicit purchases. But then as they understood more deeply what he was up to, they decided that he was malevolent. And they simply cut him out of Second Life, taking his $3,000 worth of property and confiscating it. Bragg responded, in fact, by suing Linden Labs in the state courts of Pennsylvania. It was removed to a federal court. And it's an ongoing piece of litigation. So this seemed an ideal case to do mock trial, because it was an interesting case in its own right actually involving a Second Life issue. And we wound up trying this case with my evidence, excuse me, my Cyber One students, my face-to-face -face students, acting as the lawyers and preparing the case on both sides. The extension school students provided the witnesses in the case. So one extension school student played the role of Phil Rosedale. Um, another extension school student played the role of Bragg. 
And most interestingly, we selected a jury from the at-large audience of Second Life. And so there we had the three components of the class working together in a way that added to the experience of each one. And it worked out in a way that was just extremely satisfactory. So, so much so that this fall, uh, I'm teaching a class that is titled Trials in Second Life. And we're going to build the whole class around a series of mock trials in Second Life. So there was an example of a capacity that this medium offered that I simply hadn't had available before. That's also suggestive of another aspect of the class that was, I think, uh, instructive. One of the biggest sensitivities was whether the kids in the face-to-face -face class would somehow feel that their experience was diminished, diluted in some way, by them being used, so to speak, as the focal point for the remote class. But part of this class that we were teaching was the development of empathic arguments. And each of my face-to-face -face students put together an empathic argument, first in audio and then developed it in website. And the remote audience provided an audience which functioned very much like a focus group so that the face-to-face -face students could make their argument to a focus group of the remote students and get feedback in a way that was extremely beneficial. When students are doing any kind of mock argument, assembling an audience to listen to them is very difficult. And yet here, built in, was an audience of people who wanted to listen and loved the idea of participating in the critique and development of student argument. And so there was payoff. There was payoff for my students in class. There was payoff for the remote students in Rebecca's class. And there was something very interesting for the at-large audience of Second Life to attend to as, as audience and discussants. And again, a capacity that we hadn't had before that Second Life and this approach provided to us. <clears throat> one of the criticisms, uh, criticisms, excuse me, one of the one of the criticisms that I faced in doing this was from colleagues who said, why are you doing this in Second Life? Second Life is a proprietary environment. You're building a Harvard Law School campus in a proprietary environment. And you are investing resource in developing assets in a proprietary environment. How can you be sure that that environment will be there tomorrow? How can you be sure that Second Life won't be sold to some other company or its philosophy change? That's a serious critique. I answer it by saying if someone, uh, an educator, is interested in experimenting with new forms of education, you want to use the best tool that's available. And no question at this point, Second Life is the best available tool for exploring the possibility of this kind of immersive future education. But at the same time, it does point up some real worries from a university point of view. Now, what can university do about it? I should say, I should say, Second Life, from our point of view, is a benevolent dictator or god. They have uh, actually invested in education as something they want to develop. They have full-time staff that's there to assist. They give discounts on the real estate price. They provide some uh, helpful environments. But at the same time, it's perfectly clear that education is not their top priority. They, this is uh, a, a for-profit company. It's driven by the things that make them profit. And the educational priorities are down the line. So for example, uh, a fundamental tool for a teacher is a blackboard. We don't have a blackboard in Second Life. Uh, it would be great if in Second Life my students could do the equivalent of what they do when they go to a library, which is be in the environment and yet be 
fluidly connected online with, through their browser or with a PDF reader or with all sorts of other things. You can't yet do that in Second Life. And it would be great if education was the top priority so that those tools were being built, but it's, it's not quite so yet. On the other hand, for any one university to undertake the, oh, thank you, to undertake the uh, challenge of developing a further environment that would take the best of what Second Life offers and advance it is a very large undertaking. Second Life, in addition to some of these limitations, is not a scalable environment. And so from a university point of view, which might have the ambition of extending its education as widely as possible, uh, Second Life has, has real limitation at this point. And so when one starts to think about the future of education, as I think this Second Life experience, it, that it definitely forces thought in that direction. It suggests the development of a next generation environment. Uh, and that development is going to require a very substantial investment of research energies and financial resources. I think not something that any one university would undertake, but very possibly something that a collection of universities and um, perhaps a collection that included um, an environment such as Singapore, which seems to have as one of its real interests engaging uh, a, a world that develops a scalable, immersive environment. Uh, that's, that looms as a great possibility. I'd also uh, say that this experience of mine led me to immediate thoughts about what I wanted to do in the immediate future. Uh, and that takes me to poker, on which I'm not going to spend any great time here, except to say that the idea of game and the idea of game within game, imagining the second life or the next generation second life as the meta game, but games of skill that draw kids in and engage them and provide a platform from which one can extend to the metaphors of poker and other games of skill, connecting it with traditional forms of education. That seems like a direction uh, that is very desirable. So that the ultimate vision from a university perspective, I think, is the possibility of offering an attractive educational engaging experience to anyone who can reach a node on the net which could ultimately lead them to university connecting the brightest minds with uh, the greatest institutions.